Mr. Lou, I'd like to start off by asking, you know, we talk about this idea of leading a moral life without a belief in the supreme being. And of course, the first thing that clicks to my mind was when George Bush made that statement about how he didn't think that atheists could be considered true Americans and as such should not be president of the United States. I'd like to know, when you first heard that comment, what, what went through your head? What went through my head was a uh, statement that was made a long, long time ago by an Hasidic Jewish rabbi the Hasidim was a movement in, in Central Europe of very pious Jews. And this rabbi had made a statement to his congregation that when God created the world, he created everything for a purpose. So someone came to him and said, why did God create atheists? And the good rabbi said, behind every creation there is a purpose, so that when someone comes to you in need and asks your help, you must not say to that person, take your problems to God and God will help you. You must act toward that person as if there was no God and you were the only person who could do the rescuing. Now, George Bush obviously doesn't know about this kind of teaching, this kind of thinking. For an, a Jewish Hasidic rabbi to say that you get your ethical and moral dimensions and directions from atheism rather than from traditional Judaism, uh, it seems rather shocking to say the least. But what he was saying is, and this is what the humanists believe, that ethics and morals come out of people living together and acting together and being responsible for, for one another. And uh, if George Bush can only get his from a book, the Bible, and with the, once you do this, you select what you want because there are all kinds of ethical norms within the Bible. Uh, I think he's out of touch with reality. And that was my reaction. The first thing I thought about was this fantastic statement by this Hasidic rabbi. And my feeling was, poor George, <laughs> I feel for him. Wow. Um, well, when I first started this program, I made an allusion to the American Revolution and of how, I guess we could call it the humanist uh, movement or the free thought movement was in its embryonic states. Uh, was that an accurate statement or does the free thought movement have its roots deeper and further back in history than the American Revolution? I've just been doing a study of this and in every culture, in every culture there have been free thought people. Uh, in India, the Vedic script, scriptures, the Hindu scriptures, are the oldest. When Buddha gets a new concept and rejects the patterns of the old and goes out and moves among the people in a new and different way, this is a free thought act. And Confucius, who has no, had no belief in God and, and in the uh, spiritual powers that were current in the Chinese thinking, broke away and proposed another way of approaching life. This was a free thought concept. And as you go back through the history of humans, biblical, there's uh, free thought within the Bible, if people know how to interpret it and read it. There's free thought all the way through human history. And what has happened here is a new country coming into being. We find he, even here, people are beginning to think for themselves and, and weigh and say, okay, this is what has been said. We are in a new world facing new patterns of living. Uh, we have uh, to make our way and learn to live together. Perhaps we need to think, rethink what has been our tradition. And one of the things that happened was the break away from the control of the church, uh, which was very powerful in Europe. And free thought said, if we allow the church to control us here, then we will not have the freedom to be whoever we are as Americans. And that's, that's what began to develop the free thought movement here. And of course, with that uh, comes the whole concept of democracy, government of the people, by the people, for the people, rather than something imposed on, uh, from above by a religious order or by a tyrant or a king or anything else. Mm -hmm. But I'm wondering, as in, in the process, when we have a new country and I guess a new country in, in a way might demand a new philosophy if the Civil War dealt a powerful blow to the free thought movement because when the, when the Civil War was occurring, uh, the story of Cain and Abel, of course, got a lot of play, so to speak, you know, brother against brother mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. Um, 
It's been suggested that before the Civil War that America really was on the verge of some kind of a free thought uh, revolution. When, when did the free thought movement begin to know itself as a free thought movement? I don't know exactly what date this happened, but the concepts are there. I think to, to give a label to something like free thought um, and say the free thought movement, what was happening in, in religion is something that very few people know about in, in terms of the general public, was a whole critical study, the matter of critical examination of the past. And one of the studies focused on biblical literature. This was not being done by pagans and atheists and so on. This was being done by church people who were very much concerned about, well, the, the discovery of a new world. Uh, there was no place in the Bible for, what, uh, for America. How do you account for this? And so we had legends growing up that this was one of the sons of Noah came over here and did this and so on. But that didn't make sense. We had the story of the Noah's Ark. We had Sir Walter Raleigh going around and figuring out, he writes a book on two volumes on the history of the world, which I love, two volumes, uh, in which he was able to put all the animals in the ark and the birds and so on. And then they keep discovering new things. And so we're into new ways of thinking about this doesn't make sense. We have the whole Darwinian kind of thing taking place. And as these things begin to bubble and boil and people are thinking about the world in new and different ways. Free thought is in the genes of the people, so to speak. Copernicus, Galileo, the Earth is not sitting on a, as a flat plane any longer. Columbus and all the others found out that it was a, a circle, which the Greeks knew a long time ago, uh, or a globe. Uh, the sun does not go across the heavens and travel through a tunnel at night so it can have sunrise and sunset. We still use the language. All of that was changing the whole concept. And this meant that people were asking questions that had never been asked before, challenging the teachings of the Bible, challenging the way that religion had interpreted what life was about and how it came into being. And so the essence was there. Now, when it begins to develop into a movement is when you get humanist organizations, ethical culture organizations taking place. But uh, that didn't happen in the beginning. You had voices all over the place, breaking away and raising questions, starting little movements that lasted and faded away, but the ideas were there. Free thought, think for yourself, pursue your own ideas, stand up and work your own way through things. Hmm. But I'm wondering what, what happened. I mean, here we are 200 years later since 1776, and we just had a former president you know, make that statement that I made at the beginning. I mean, why, why, hasn't, why aren't we dominated by free thought and humanism today? I think our educational system is partly to blame. We are uh, controlled in many ways or dominated by many ways by groups of people who insist that their interpretations be part of the curriculum, whether it makes sense or not. For instance, we have a whole creationist group who want to have the biblical story of creation put in a science program, and it makes no sense. You have the sun and moon, uh, the sun isn't created until after plants have been created. And this, we know that we, for photosynthesis, you have to have the sun and so on. Uh, the order of creation is wrong. All kinds of problems are involved in this. But these people insist on reinterpreting biblical things to kind of make them fit science, and it simply doesn't work. But they insist that this concept of God doing something to bring it into being, whether he's rolling man out of clay like a child in the kindergarten or not, however they want to interpret this, that be taught as science. And this makes no sense. So we, our educational system is faulty. It does not teach people to think creatively. I give essays in my class. I hand out a, a statement of a book review or something like this to be done. And I say, I want you to criticize what this person says, analyze what this person says in this article. I get back and they tell me exactly what he said. I said, no, no, I want you to evaluate it. And they'll say, now, these are university kids. They say, we've never done that. Hmm. They've always given back their exams. You give back what you've been told. You don't think for yourself. You don't create and put things together. And so we have, we have really not done justice to the potential of our students with this way of thinking. And George Bush coming up out of that and others coming up out of that kind of thinking 
will move in traditional ways rather than critical and, and novel ways as they move out into the world. You know, you wouldn't know that if you watch a lot of uh, fundamentalist programming. I was watching the Old Time Gospel Hour uh, last Sunday, and Jerry Falwell said that the secular humanists are now controlling the colleges and the high schools and the media and the government. And But from listening to what you're saying, I, our kids are failing because of the fundamentalists, because of the creationists. Well, creationists and others like this. Um, this idea of, of the secular humanist controlling all these things. What has happened is that we have brought into our schools the best scientific information we, we know. We have to be very careful about using certain kind of language. And so when you want to tell about how the world came into being, you use geological terms and so on. But when you talk about the process of change by which it comes, you can't use the word evolution because that's a taboo word. And so we avoid it and we move around these things to keep certain groups of people happy. When, and at the same time, we have scientists who are planning to build uh, space colonies on the moon, uh, space stations as the Russians have, uh, that will circle the Earth, and so on and so on. This is the new frontier. But the moral, ethical dimensions are still based on ancient concepts. Take, for instance, this whole debate that's going on right now on homosexuality and the, and the military. The anti-gay attitudes come directly out of biblical teaching. And the people who insist that this is the guideline uh, by which you judge morality, sexual morality, uh, are simply not in touch with reality. Solomon had 300 wives and 700 concubines, or was it the other way around? But anyway, any rate, a very busy man uh, sexually. Is this the model that you want for, for uh, no, no, we, we don't want his. We go to Jesus. Jesus says, if a man uh, divorces his wife for any, you're not supposed to divorce your wife for anything except adultery. We divorce people for all kinds of things. So what we do is combine the practical, we ignore what we don't want, and we pick out something like the homosexual issue, and we gun down these people. That's the way this is done. The same thing with evolution. We gun down people on this. And so when Fowler makes a stupid statement like secular humanism is doing this, this is simply the people growing with the times in a scientific age, an age of excitement, of wonder, and of creativity. And uh, he wants us to go back to what it was 2,000 years ago, and I don't want to live that way. Well, you, you know, we mentioned the term secular humanist. That's getting a lot of play these days, the term secular humanist. But I understand that there are many different brands of humanism. There's, there's secular humanist, uh, ethical culture. Cult, ethical culture. Then, of course, there's free thinkers. Why don't we go down the list here and just try to, what, what, what is the subtle differences that, say, would, would make an ethical culturalist not the same thing as a secular humanist? An ethical culturalist, ethical culture came out of a movement that began uh, a little over 100 years ago. Felix Adler was a Jewish rabbi, a reform rabbi, and he studied in Germany. When he came back, he made the statement to something like this, to the congregation of his father's temple in New York, that the things that separate people are the theologies. But if we can get together on the ethics, the way people live, the values that we live by, then we can ignore the theologies that, uh, uh, that separate us. So he organized this movement and he began to operate in New York. To join the ethical culture movement, you can believe in God or not believe in God. It doesn't matter. The focus, there's nothing of theology, no hymns, no prayers, nothing of this in the movement at all. The focus is on ethical values. Well, that has brought in a lot of atheists, a lot of agnostic, a lot of deists who believe that God's there somewhere out in space but has nothing to do with the world, the theists who believe that God is active. And if you want to pray, that's up to you. But your focus is on the values that unite people, the values that George Bush thinks that non-believers can't have. And the whole movement is geared to that. Humanism, and it is a humanistic movement because its emphasis is on the human. Secular human, humanism wants to say, no, we don't even want to mention the people that believe in God don't belong in this. They, uh, if you want to be an ethical culturist, that's fine. Secular humanism is purely atheistic. It focuses entirely on, on human beings. It doesn't acknowledge God. 
uh, <coughs> Paul Kurtz has coined a new word, igtheist, as opposed to atheist. An igtheist is one who says, I don't know what you're talking about when you talk about God. The, I am ignorant of the nature of God. I am ignorant of the whole concept of God. And so, and if you start analyzing what people, God concept means to people, it has many different facets. And so this is a new kind of language that's coming in. But all of these are concerned, all the humanist movements, whether it's materialistic, uh, which means that everything in the universe, tables, books, you, me, are material of the universe, naturalism, which deals with the nature and so on, all of these focus on the human. And that means that they are all humanistic, that the emphasis is there. Now, we have that in religion, too. When uh, the Cardinal uh, Mahoney uh, sets up a mission to aid students, uh, to aid AIDS patients, and has a hospice working with this, that's a humanistic outreach. When he condemns homosexuality, that's a theological, and I say a non-humanistic outreach, because he's barring certain people and saying you're not fit to be uh, associated with the true faith and so on. So we have a thrust of humanism that's in religion. Whenever it reaches out to the needs of other people, we go back to our rabbi. Mm. When I was reading um, the Humanist Manifestos 1 and 2, which I understand that there are some humanists who would you know, probably think that the time has come for a number three because they're not kind of sure if they can back up everything in one and two. But when I'm reading this, I get the feeling that the early founders of the humanist movements uh, really wanted to start uh, a third religion, so to speak, to um, serve as an alternative to, uh, say, Judaism, Christianity, or whatever other religion was out there. Is that pretty accurate? That's, that's part of it. Many of the people who first began were Unitarians. And within Unitarian religion, there are those who are agnostics and non-believers and those who keep something of the old belief alive. This was the group of the free-thinking, independent-thinking Unitarians. And so when they set up the humanist movement, this was to attract people who were not in the Unitarian uh, fellowship but who had these kind of ideas and didn't want to be part of the Unitarian Fellowship. So they saw the humanist movement there. And then there were a lot of other people who were non-believers. It wasn't so much a setting up of a new faith as it was a matter of bringing together people who had much in common and who had no place to go to express this. They were not allowed and were not permitted or not welcomed to express these ideas in church settings. But here they could get out and discuss the implications of this, that, and the other thing as it affected them, as it affected society, outside of organized religion. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, in a sense, but it wasn't thought of as a religion. It was an organization of free-thinking, humanistically inclined individuals. When you hear people talk about the humanist movement on television, and generally, um, it's not like we have a humanist network out there. Most of uh, the publicity for humanism, for good or ill, is coming from the religious stations talking about how bad the mm -hmm. humanists are. What I'd like to know is, you know, they talk about humanists like uh, they're a liberal group of socialists trying to get the world into one big political framework here. Uh, what I'd like to know is, what is the political makeup of your average humanist? Are, are they pretty much liberal Democrats, conservative Republicans? That's a good one. Um, first of all, it's not a political movement. Okay. And therefore, it has within it everything. Uh, there was one old boy that I remember, he's long dead now, but he had come out of Russia and he had never really let go of a communist ideal. And he'd rant and rave about things from one point of view. There are Republicans, there are Democrats, there are independents. Uh, it's made up of everything. There is. It, it cuts across, like most church groups. You go into a ch uh, Methodist church and they'll have Republicans and, and others in there, you know, and, and Democrats in the membership. So this is a, is a cross-section of human culture. And uh, the thing they hold in common is the concern for values that are human in origin and human in concern, and the belief in and adherence to the scientific method of testing claims for truth um, 
the belief in democracy as the best possible way of organizing uh, civilization, the belief in the rights of people to express themselves, freedom, all the freedoms that are in our Constitution, all of these basic things that make this country and other democratic countries the great powerhouse that they have become in time, this one particularly, so that um, there is no political orientation or, or uh, a set of uh, political beliefs. We have everything in there. And that makes for wonderful dialogue as long as people keep cool and share their ideas on an intelligent basis. But rationalism is the key, as mm -hmm. opposed to being carried away by emotionalism. Love is a great thing, but it can cloud judgment. Uh, at least in some of the marriages I've seen, they've been bad, mad marriages. You should never have married him, and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Madeline Murray <coughs> O'Hare is fond of closing her American Atheist programs by saying, and never forget, religion has done more harm than any single idea. I'd like to ask you that, being a professor of religion yourself, do you, do you believe that religion has done more harm than any single idea? I think it's done a lot of harm. I think it's done a lot of good. Uh, one of the questions I, I raise in my own thinking is, to what extent has religion given guidance to people who might be violent and might be ruthless without the belief that somewhere, somehow, they're going to be judged for their actions, that there is a time of reckoning. So that in individual lives and in individual families, I think that religion has had some very positive effects. At the same time, in individual lives and in individual families and in society at large, religions had some terribly negative things. Wars in Ireland between the North and the South, Catholics and Protestants. Uh, Lebanon, which is absolutely insane with Christians and, and uh, Muslims uh, at each other's throat, and groups within each of these. Israel with Judaism and, and the Muslims opposed to each other, and on and on and on it goes. So that, uh, yes, there's been terrible wars from crusades, uh, some of the exploitation of children. All of these things are there. But at the same time, there have been some very positive things. The, the hospice movement came out of a religious conviction by Cecily Saunders, a medical religious conviction by Cecily Saunders in England that is catering to people who are in terminal illness. These are good things. But the things that have come out of religion that are good are always the humanistic, always the humanistic things. Mm, I remember when I was at the <coughs> banquet uh, that was sponsored by the Humanist Association of Los Angeles, um, Austin Miles was making a comment about how somebody wanted to get the Bible out of a high school library because it was obscene, but who fought to keep the Bible in the school library was a humanistic organization. I thought that was quite interesting. Absolutely. You see, one of the things that a humanist realizes is that the religions of the world are part of his heritage or her heritage. The, this is part of the human searching for meaning. And whether they go off in different angles and different directions, this is still part. I was at a conference in Dallas where one man said, I'd like to get rid of everything I had to do with religion. I'm not prepared to do that. I go into these magnificent cathedrals and see these are works of human beings who have put this together, whatever their aspirations are in terms of faith. I see the great art, great music. I'm not willing to let that go because it comes out of religion. That's part of my heritage. Well, Mr. Lurie, I'd like to thank you for being here on our program. And let me show the books that Mr. Lurie has written. Of course, The Way of Ethical Humanism, which concerns itself with living a moral life without a belief in the supreme being. And of course, we have this one uh, from Prometheus, The Supernatural, The Occult, and The Bible. You might want to take a look at that. It covers uh, all sorts of superstitious beliefs that people have and the roots of them. Thank you for being with us, and we will see you next time.